Hello, this is Free Thought Forum, a program sponsored by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. I'm Carl. I am A.V. Castile. And I'm Shawnee Castile. We want you to know that if you don't believe in God, you're not alone. Right here in East Tennessee, there are free-thinking atheists and agnostics. This show is for them and people committed to a life rooted in science, unfettered by supernatural beliefs. On today's show, we're going to discuss secular parenting and raising kids secular. Before we begin, we want to tell viewers about the show's sponsors. The Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK, meets one or more times a week. We have evening meetups for fun, food, drink, and conversation. Find us online at knoxvilleatheistwithans.org. The purpose of the ASK is to supply a venue for community, camaraderie, and outreach to atheists, agnostics, freethinkers, and other like-minded persons in the East Tennessee area. And as Matt Dillahunty at the Atheist Experience says, everyone is welcome to our happy hour for food, drink, and conversation. But if you plan to preach, proselytize, provoke, or punch, please don't. The Rationalists of East Tennessee have several regular monthly meetings. See our website, rationalists.org, for details. The first and third Sunday of the month are usually lectures with lively roundtable discussions. The second Sunday, we hold the Skeptics Book Club, and on the fourth Sunday, we're mixing it up sometimes with a potluck get-together in a member's home, which we call a Reflections Meeting. Later in the show, we'll give you our websites to visit for additional details, including times and locations. Okay, in the news. Local politics divided over religion. Tennessee Lieutenant Governor attacks candidate because she's a dangerous atheist. On February 28, t Tennessee Lieutenant Governor Randy McNally is attacking a state Senate candidate because she is a dangerous atheist. In her daily work, she directs an organization called Recovering from Religion. Most Tennessees, Tennesseans, whether they are strong believers or not, recognize the strength and comfort faith provides. Gail Jordan rejects faith as a positive as a positive force for good in the world. She believes faith is something from which people need to be rescued. This is not the type of person we need in the Tennessee Senate. Yes, actually that, that quote was uh, from Michael Stone. Um, Randy McNally took a cue from our Twitter in chief and he tweeted, in my 40 plus years in politics, I've seen few candidates as dangerous as Gail Jordan. We need to strongly reject her assault on faith and our Tennessee values. Why would McNally take a cue and suggest that Ms. Jordan is so dangerous? I think it's because he's uh, basically showing that he's uh, bigoted against other people with different beliefs. Uh, if he said that about Jews or uh, any other religion, he would have been rejected by quite a few people in most Republicans saying it's not appropriate whether they believe it or not. But atheists are still fair game uh, as far as bigotry. Right. And um, I mean, in my opinion, too, he's pretty much uh, denying her her First Amendment rights uh, by denying her or calling her dangerous simply because of what her religious beliefs are. And he's essentially telling his own constituents who aren't adhering to his his same religious beliefs, that they themselves are dangerous. Um, it's, it's kind of a questionable, dirty politics at that, at that point. I think it's also part of the whole idea that uh, Christianity is, uh, should be exempt from any sort of criticism or challenges mm -hmm. or any uh, questioning of, of beliefs. And also Christianity covers a wide range of, of beliefs, and not all Christians would think that she's a, a problem. But, there is still a majority of people that uh, wouldn't accept atheists for polit a politician. Position. Right, yeah. And I mean, one of the questions is, do atheists have a book which gives examples on how to kill people? No, we don't. But in Luke 19, 27, which is a Christian book, the New Testament, but those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. So accusing her of being dangerous simply because she doesn't follow this religious practice is absolutely ridiculous. It's, it's uh, the religious right running scared. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it because 
the danger is is that they realize they may be losing their privileged position mm -hmm. in holding, especially in the state in the South. So right. It's a danger to their their um, special status, which mm -hmm. they don't shouldn't have anyway. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it's how low will they go? How low Pretty will they low. stoop? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. He didn't attack her politics. He didn't attack her platform. Her involvement in the community. He simply attacked her being an atheist, which is not even part of her platform. And also even recovering well, from religion is a matter of helping people who have decided to leave religion or thinking about it. She's not, she, that organization isn't pulling people away, it's just helping people who decide to leave. Right. And we have a caller already. Oh. Hello, caller. Do you have a name or nickname that you'd like to go by? Yes, this is Charles from Central Illinois. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Charles from Central Illinois. Hello, Charles Hi. from Central Illinois. How are Hello, you doing Charles. today? So far, so good. <laughs> uh, and in regards to this uh, raising the secular kids, uh, I was, uh, saw a video by uh, Professor Tyson, Professor Neil deGrasse Tyson, and he commented on how one of the ways he was raising his child was he uh, taught them how to do checking things. Mm -hmm. Like one of the things he had them check was for the tooth fairy. <laughs> and uh, what he did was he had his daughter um, put uh, paper, tissue paper, around her bed after she lost a tooth, stuck it in underneath the pillow. And uh, when she woke up, the uh, uh, tooth was still there and none of the tissue paper had been disturbed. So, one of the ways to raise a secular child is to teach them how to check things. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, that's a very good way. I, I guess it is a good thing, though, that um, a vent didn't turn on in the middle of the night if it was tissue paper. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that, that is a good way. It's, it's question everything. Uh, that's yes. one of the problem people don't question, though. I, I remember a case of a child who um, said that um, he or she now actually saw the tooth fairy and it looked just like his mom. They still didn't give up the, <laughs> the source of revenue, I guess. <laughs> but it's, it's, I think it's important to have your kids think for themselves. So teach them to think for themselves and question everything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, uh, the comment among many people is don't teach your children what to think, but how teach to them think. How to think. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. I agree. All right, and Charles, we know you're in central Illinois, but next time you're in East Tennessee, come out to Rationalist, come to Ask One Night. We'd absolutely love to have you. I would love to if I ever get the money together. All right. And uh, I must note that, uh, what's her name? The woman that declared that she had uh, cured a woman of her hysterectomy, Cindy Jacobs or Cindy Jones. Uh, and who had declared herself to be a prophetess, is now declaring that she has now has divine authority over the deep state. <laughs> I keep trying to figure out what the deep state actually is and how God gave her authority over it. But it's not hard to get authority over That's just me being a heretic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like what Carl said. It's it's not difficult to have authority over nothing. <laughs> Something that doesn't exist. Right. Yep. Okay. You all have a good one. All right. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. So I guess we'll go right into the, the topic. We absolutely can. <laughs> so according to PewResearch.org, the, the total number of secular people are nuns. It's expected to increase from 1.17 billion globally in 2015 to 1.2 billion globally in 2060. That is actually a decrease uh, from 16 to 13 percent. If that occurs, predictions are always questionable, the reason why would be that uh, the non-religious affiliated people are not reproducing as fast 
is the same rate of theists. And I'd like to just throw in there before hosting starts, is, mm -hmm. that, is that, um, that is making a lot of assumptions about what's going to be happening in the future and how much um, cultures change. And typically, the more developed countries become, the more secular they become. So right. it depends a lot mm -hmm. on, the, on the world's transitioning. Yeah, I mean, we've got a long way to go before we get to 2060. Mm -hmm. This is, mm -hmm. it could definitely change. No, I'm not getting there. <laughs> <laughs> you might. Science is coming a long way. <clears throat> You'll be the bionic man. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Just putting him. laughs> With this projected trend, how do the non-religious raise their children in a, in a theistic world? And what are some of the effects of raising children without religion? Uh, sociologists have come to some very interesting conclusions regarding children raised in secular households. The bottom line, uh, these children are more empathetic, moral, and compassionate than those raised in religious households. I, th I think that, again, that jump off the script in a minute. Mm. I think that too is kind of varies about from uh, whether you have more liberal Christians, mm -hmm. are actually secular humanists in a sense because they just, they just hang on to some of the myths. Uh, they're usually more like deists. So again, that's kind of a broad statement there, but um, uh, to, to, you take the large fundamentalist sort of groups that dominate a lot of the states, that would make sense. Mm -hmm. So we'll start with an article from the LA Times written by Phil Zuckerman, professor of sociology and secular studies at Pfizer College, January 14, 2015, was the date, how secular values stack up. And to quote that study, more children are growing up godless than at any other time in our nation's history. They're, go they're, offspring, <laughs> they're offspring of an expanding secular population that includes relatively new and burgeoning category of Americans called the nuns. So nicknamed because they're identified as believing in nothing in particular in a 2012 Pew Research Study. The number of American children raised without religion has grown significantly since the 1950s, when fewer than 4% reported growing up in non-religious households. But according to recent studies, the uh, figure has doubled when in 2012 the study showed 11% of people born after 1970 said they've been raised in secular households. This may explain why 23% of adults in the U.S. claim to have no religion, and more than 30% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 29 say the same. So how does raising it, the raising of outstanding moral children work without prayers at mealtimes and morality lessons at Sunday school? Quite well, it seems. Far from being dysfunctional, nihilistic, nihilistic <laughs> excuse me, and rudderless, Without the security and rectitude of religion, secular households provide a sound and solid foundation for children, according to Vern Bingston, a USC professor of gerontology and sociology. For nearly 40 years, Bingston, Bingston, Bingston excuse me, has overseen the longitudinal study of generations which has become the largest study of religion and family life conducted across several generational cohorts in the United States. When Bingston noticed the growth of non-religious Americans becoming increasingly pronounced, he decided in 2013 to add secular families to his study in an attempt to understand how family life and intergenerational intergener Influences play out among the religiousless, religionless, religionless. Yes. Excuse me. He was surprised by what he found: high levels of family solidarity and emotional closeness between parents and non-religious youth, and strong ethical standards and moral values that had been clearly articulated as they were imparted to the next generation. Can I interrupt you a second? Sure. Because mm -hmm. it's interesting. It says he was surprised. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. A little bit of a bias in there to start with. People don't actually know that you can be good without a con. <laughs> yes. It's surprising to some people. <laughs> Let's see. So but, many 
Okay, sorry, I got off track. I I Many non religious <laughs> parents were more coherent and passionate about their ethical principles than some of the religious parents in our study. Bingston told me the vast majority appeared to live goal filled lives characterized by moral direction and sense of life having purpose. My own ongoing research among secular Americans as well as that of a handful of other social scientists who have only recently turned their gaze on secular culture confirms that non-religious family life is replete with its own sustaining moral values and enriching ethical precepts. Chief among those, rational problem solving, personal autonomy, independence of thought, avoidance of corporal punishment, a spirit of questioning everything, and far above all, empathy. I want to go ahead. No, it's fine. I want to throw something else in again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that um, one of the um, differences um, with secular parenting is, in secularists in general is, as far as ethics and morality is, since uh, we aren't told this is what you're supposed to believe, we mm -hmm. actually have to think about it, research it, analyze it, question it, observe. Uh, and so there tends to be more interest in ethics with, um, with non-religious people, I've found, mm -hmm. than with li religious people in, in trying to explore it. Also, with the uh, whole idea of raising children, I think there's more of a tendency with non-religious and more liber liberal religious, religious people to actually research and look at the, the science and the studies and developments in, in child behavior and, mm -hmm. and psychology. So mm -hmm. I think those um, are some of the underlying reasons that, that that's the way it's turned out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and to continue uh, what Zuckerman wrote about this, uh, for secular people, morality is predicted on one simple principle, empathetic reciprocity, widely known as the golden rule. Treating other people as you would like to be treated is an ancient, universal, and ethical imperative, and it requires no supernatural beliefs. As one atheist mom who wanted to be identified only as Debbie told me, the way we teach them what is right and what is wrong is by trying to instill a sense of empathy, how other people feel. You know, just trying to give them that sense of what it's like to be on the other end of their action. And I don't see any need for God in that. If your morality is all tied in with God, she continued, what if you at some point start to question the existence of God? Does that mean your moral sense suddenly crumbles? The way we are teaching our children, no matter what they choose to believe later in life, even if they become religious or whatever, they are still going to have that system. Can I interrupt now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm the interrupter. You're fine, Carl. <laughs> um, and I think one thing that differentiates, differentiates us from um, the more fundamentalist religion, religious people is that we realize that empathy is an in, inherent part, uh, just a, a key part of uh, human psychology and, mm -hmm. and emotional um, composure. And you know, it has an evolutionary basis that goes down. I mean, you even found some empathy, empathetic behaviors in rats. Um, so if somebody says you're a dirty rat, maybe you have something. <laughs> but but uh, and uh, so I, I think that's another thing that makes it um, uh, secular parenting um, deeper and and have more significance because there's a deeper understanding of humans actually function, and we don't have this idea that you're inherently evil. Mm -hmm. We realize that you're inherently a lot of things, and one of them is, is empathetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, they've come to a conclusion that the results of secular child rearing are encouraging. Studies have found that secular teenagers are far less likely to care what the cool kids think or to express a need to fit in with them than their religious peers. When these teens mature into godless adults, they exhibit less racism than their religious counterparts, according to a 2010 Duke University study. Many psychological studies show that secular grown-ups tend to be less vengeful, less nationalistic, less militaristic, less authoritarian, and more tolerant on average than religious adults. So, I mean... That, that rings true for my teen, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, she 
pretty much gets along with everybody. You know that. And she doesn't care what other people think. So I think that that definitely is true. Yeah, I think that whole generation is, is She's real. kind, Go ahead. friendly, outgoing, she and she rough. doesn't care. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. She doesn't care. She's a cool kid. But she mm -hmm. is actually a cool kid because of all of those things. Right. Because everybody loves her. Yeah. yeah. I think that's one reason there's a correlation between, uh, especially the teenage generation. I forgot what that was called. Now there's so many different generation names. Mm -hmm. um, but that they are more accepting um, and uh, uh, more tolerant and less aggressive. Mm -hmm. but the, And also... More That's secular. More secular. They are more secular. Uh, this upcoming generation is amazingly secular. Yes. Um, which goes into, which is probably going to help this trend get even better. Uh, research has shown less than half of 1%, and this was in, in the 90s, so it hasn't been updated recently, but according to the Federal Bureau of Prisons, uh, less than one half of 1% of people in the federal prison population actually identify as atheist or secular. That is obviously does not correlate to the general population of the United States. It is significantly lower. Yeah, even if you say there's some inaccuracy there of, of one or two percent, it's mm -hmm. still it's, a trivial amount. <laughs> right. I mean, it could be some people just won't say it because it might be dangerous. Mm -hmm. But still, the, the, even taking those kind of things into account, um, you know, statistically doesn't change the the right term for that. The demographic? It doesn't, what's that, doesn't that? change the significance of the statistic. Still couldn't mm -hmm. think of the term, but... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually need to take that statistics course I downloaded. Oh, did I don't know you, what okay. I was talking about. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. There's the policy I'm assuming I'm next. <laughs> All right. Another meaningful related fact, democratic countries with the lowest levels of religious faith and participation today, such as Sweden, Denmark, Japan, Belgium, New Zealand, this there not long ago, mm -hmm. among the lowest violent crime rates in the world and enjoyed remarkably high levels of societal well-being. If secular people couldn't, um, couldn't raise well-functioning moral children, then their preponderance of them in a given society would spell societal disaster, yet the opposite is true. Uh, I want to add, though, that uh, that doesn't mean these countries don't have issues. Right. Like, I discovered that New Zealand has a high suicide rate, but it's a cultural thing, apparently, with males and sort of the macho sort of image they feel like they have. And that's not related to religion. It's related to... To patriarchal society and mm -hmm. male toxicity. Male, yes. ma male, male, male issues. Yes. <laughs> not completely, but a lot of it. Also, being a secular parent and something of an expert on secular culture. Hmm, I just got promoted. <laughs> we are still quoting. <laughs> <clears throat> I know well that the angst of many... Oh, we are? She yes. was talking about me. That's okay. I know well the angst of many secular Americans experience, and they can't help but wonder, could I possibly ma be making a mistake raising my children without religion? The unequivocal answer is no. Children raised without religion have no shortage of positive traits and virtues. They ought to be warmly welcomed as a growing American um, demographic. There was something I would say that, but go ahead because I don't know what it was. All right. And um, obviously today we do have the opportunity to speak with two parents who have or are raising secular children in a largely religious society. So we've already heard a little bit from uh, A.V. about uh, her teenage daughter. Um, would you like to touch on, on your experience? Uh, Actually, I actually have a teenage granddaughter now. Yes, you do. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of a unique situation in a way, though, because we had a private school, and she actually attended that until she got into um, middle school. Um, interestingly, too, the first thing she, when she came back from middle school was she said, there are people there who don't want to learn. Because <laughs> she thought it was a strange thing. <laughs> so, now, was she going to public school or private school? Uh, at that time, public school. Public. She later went to... Um, uh, Alabama School of Fine Arts, mm. which is public too, but it was um, uh, sort of a specialty sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I remember an interesting thing that happened when she was about three or four, three I think, maybe four, probably three, um, 
wife had to take her to a daycare, and the only one she could find on the spot was at a Baptist church. <laughs> and so I came by to pick him up later, and she said, um, I think you need to talk to talk to our daughter. She's learned something at the church at <laughs> daycare. <laughs> I said, what was it? She says, said, I learned that God sits up in clouds in the sky. And I said, you know what clouds are, don't you? It's like fog. She said, yeah. And I said, how can you sit on that? <laughs> <laughs> and kind of let it go, because she was just a little. Mm -hmm. But when she was growing up, she said, that actually made a big impression on her. <laughs> oh, good. It actually, part of that thinking about what's actually there, mm -hmm. what can happen, how that makes sense or not. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it's important to start early because that's when a lot of the ideas, the patterns are, are set up. So it's really unfair to children in religious situations to be so inculcated with this, this doctrine and, and mythology that those brain patterns are set up where it's hard to escape those. Mm -hmm. and sometimes it's traumatic if they do try to escape when they do. Um, so those are... Um, some, some sort of things to remember, but she was um, always independent and questioning, and I often accused her I'm going to be a lawyer when she grows up because she always wanted to discuss the values of uh, what we thought she should do or not. <laughs> so, and, and that was a good thing. Yes, yeah. I mean, they, they're, they're open to discussion, and, uh, they're, you know, in my experience, I don't have children of my own, but I'm around her children yeah. all the time. Nieces and nephews. Yes, I do. I do. One other thing I want to throw in, though, is that sometimes there's a mistake made that um, you shouldn't set any limits for children. And, uh, you know, from when they're really small, you have to set limits to keep them safe because mm -hmm. they just don't know that much about the world. Right. And the trick is is to change with them on how you work those limits mm -hmm. and, and, and how you deal with them about uh, thinking and, and working through things. Mm -hmm. And I was raised as a sec by s in a secular sort of way because my parents didn't bother to take me to church until mm -hmm. I was fourth grade. So I think that was a big reason, too, that I didn't have those ideas just burned in my brain to mm -hmm. start with. The time I was 16, I suddenly realized I was an atheist. <laughs> so I, it was a matter where I read something that said, um, uh, a character didn't believe in God in a book, mm -hmm. and I thought everybody believes in God. And I thought even if they did, that doesn't mean it's true. Mm -hmm. One and two, I don't think I do. <laughs> and then I realized that I didn't. That's a good conclusion to come to, in my opinion. Um, now, have either of you noticed that, uh, like with your child as growing up and yours now, uh, that their moral compass points a little more true north? than what a lot of parents maybe complain about. Um, have you, have either of you noticed a difference uh, with your children? That their moral compass por points a little I, more true, yes, true north. Believe, yes, Ours didn't Mine. move, our daughter did move to the north. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes, and then she had children of her own. Another funny story. Uh, we were in San Diego this summer and the daughter's family was down there and um, a little five-year-old um, asked us if we'd been to the Big T, and that was the giant cross on Mount Soledad <laughs> in San Diego, because he didn't know it was a cross, it was the Big T. Yeah. Wait, they have one in San Diego? Yeah, up in the big... We have plenty here now. Yes, yeah, when this was on public property, they got around it by selling the property off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I recall hearing about that. But again, he related it to something useful, a letter. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, now that would upset a lot of people, but th the point is, he wasn't indoctrinated to look at that only in one way, mm -hmm. that it had to be something to be represent worshiping an instrument of torture. Well, I, w I would much <laughs> rather a child uh, identify it with a letter of the alphabet than an archaic torture device. Yes. yes. Um, reminder, yeah. callers, um, lines are open. We are a call-in show live. Mm. Number is 865-215-2288. Mm. Uh, this is not just our show, it's about you guys too. So um, with the, uh, the morality, I mean, do you notice your kids maybe are more honest, maybe lie less? I believe, yes, definitely for the most part. Um, um, maybe one, the one in the middle, maybe a little, 
<laughs> if you're about that <laughs> but yes yes mostly mm -hmm. they definitely are and um, they're very empathetic um, animals homeless uh, anybody in need they're they're definitely they have a great moral compass I believe and I do talk to them a lot about putting uh, their selves and other people's shoes mm -hmm. as well. So, you know, it, I do have to give little gentle reminders. Yeah. Like, some people don't have beds to sleep in, you know, when you're complaining that <laughs> yours isn't, you know, done up in frilly <laughs> things and bows and My Little Ponies. <laughs> but, yeah. Another thing is that children are, are different, and we'll get to that back because we have a caller now. <clears throat> Hello, caller. Do you have a name or nickname you'd like for us to call you? Caller? Be fine. Caller? Yes. All right. Give us just a moment for your, your speaker to catch up. Voice. There you go. Loud. How's that? No, there you go. You. All right. Do you have a question or a comment? Yes. Your show today is on raising kids secular. Usually, when you're raising kids, you at least give them some idea of what kind of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, persons to emulate or idols to look up to or heroes and I was wondering where one would get those heroes when our sports figures seem to have a lot of problems with differing uh, legal and, and moral problems and uh, in this day and age specifically within the past year it seems like there's less or rather the politicians to look up, you know, like George Washington, I cannot tell by and, and <laughs> which is the lie. Uh, right. So I'm thinking I'm thinking if, if you're going to have some kind of a uh, person to emulate, for example, politicians, it just doesn't appear like you can use politicians anymore. And almost universally politicians are religious in one aspect or another. Uh, usually, you know, uh, God has told them to run for public office, or they have uh, paintings of themselves in their house with uh, them alongside Jesus, and so forth and so on. So what is your opinion on using politicians? Mine is quite little uh, as, a, uh, as a character uh, standard. Um, I personally just uh, don't have my kids look up to anybody in particular. I set the foundation for their moral backing and they decide to choose. They actually don't have anybody specific that they look up to other than family members. They're not into sports or politics just, <laughs> just yet. Um, but yeah, I don't really have an answer for that because I, I don't, what? I don't teach my kids to look up to certain people. I do think though that your your teenage daughter looks up to some of our, our the, I guess the the sports figures like Kaepernick and such. Oh yes, but she also um, comments on their downfalls mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> sure I it think it's in. more of a. Um, She's very aware. Oh, yes, yes, okay, yes, Colin, yes, she does look up to him because he is uh, standing up for what is right and yeah. what he believes in, I think, I think you're regardless of the backlash. A, a point there, yes. too, is it two points. One, first, you're talking about family members, and I think with young children, that is the source, mm -hmm. which, what they look up to. As they get older, there are two things happen. One, peers get to be a big, yes. big source more than anything else, but also, I think, even with politicians, you can point out when they do something right, like one politician is really kind of a jerk and, and not too rational, but if they actually do something right, you, know, you can point out that you know, people can, can make right choices. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. And so you can, you can be selective in that sense. Um, and uh, peers are, um, like I said, are, are really a big thing, and, and they really need, and children really need to be able to judge which things make sense from the peers, mm -hmm. how to resist uh, pressure, peer pressure, and those sort of things. And that requires 
um, that sense of independent self-worth and, and uh, the critical thinking mm -hmm. kind of skills, right. uh, which I think is why they do better with, with so, uh, social situations and a lot of children that are just based on authoritarian and, and godlike figures and they make a, some wacky older kid a godlike figure or sports guy. Right. Well, I tell my kids to pay attention to people's characters regardless of their religious affiliation mm -hmm. or not. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and that's one thing we ask back. Don't always okay. get it. <laughs> Didn't know if maybe, you know, if the child comes to you and says, well, it's all right for the president to have, you know, a relationship with these young ladies. Why can't I when I grow up? Or, didn't know if that, you know, that sort of moral, so often the, the, uh, the moralistic of the, of the uh, people in our society are saying, no, we, we're going to get these people out of office who have moral mm -hmm. problems, and it just doesn't seem to be that way. I can vouch for all four of my nieces and nephews. I have heard every single one of them. They don't speak positively about Trump, and they range from age four to fifteen. Oh uh, yeah, we, I, we, I didn't specifically say Trump. Now, <laughs> well, yeah, there are did examples. That. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's plenty of examples, but he's yeah, a, just, when the president, I, he's I a place do holder. point out when <laughs> something is morally wrong, or yes, I definitely mm -hmm. point those things out if they see it. Okay. Well, yeah. I'll let some other people call in. All right, and uh, if you're local, um, come out to Ask or RET sometime. We'd absolutely love to have you, caller. Oh, okay. Bye-bye. Right, thank you. That, that reminds me of another moral issue. When I was, um, again, a little kid, maybe five years old or first grade, a preacher came to our house. Only time I ever remember anything like that happening, and I chose to play with my collection of whiskey bottle corks. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure how he took that. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea it was a problem. <laughs> right? Okay, and it is about time for our commercial break uh, so we can speak about our sponsors. Um, okay, in case you're just tuning in, you're late. <laughs> this is Free Thought Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rational of East Tennessee. Free Thought Forum is funded jointly by them and individual contributions. You wouldn't have read that from me, aren't you? We want to thank. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, UW, for staying, staying funding this show. <laughs> we have moved. This is our new regular time every Wednesday from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Knoxville Community Access Television, channel 6, 12, 99, or 193, depending on your local cable network. Tell your out-of-town friends to see us streaming online at ctvknox.org. And today's show is live on Wednesday, March the 7th. And you can call in on the number on our screen and speak to us as, we, as we've had two callers before. While we take a short break, please watch our informative videos about our sponsors. If you live in or around the Knoxville area and are questioning your religious beliefs or simply believe in one less God than everyone else, well, you're not alone. The Atheist Society of Knoxville is a fun and friendly group of people just like you that meets twice a week at a bar or restaurant. We meet every Tuesday night following the show. You'll find our group either inside or on the patio. Look for Richard Dawkins' silver-jacketed book, The God Delusion, standing upright on the table. But if you plan to preach, proselytize, provoke or punch, please don't. We all question what we believe at one point in our lives. If this is the time for you, come join us for food, drink, conversation, and fun. We're back already. All right, and um, can you continue on with our program? All right, in a commentary published by Spencer Grady Paul in The Humanist, June 17, 2018, titled Linking Religion and Teen Pregnancy. There's a map for that. We know that map. And the correlation between religious population and teen pregnancy and STI rates is disturbing. There's the map. There it is. Quoting the article, for example, the lawmakers of Tennessee have decided that sex education in their state should be mandatory only if the pregnancy rate among 15 to 16 year olds is above 
per 1,000 girls. In other words, these policymakers are willing to surrender their family values only if a certain threshold is reached. And even then, just until the rate can be brought under control. Again. I think it has to do with the dollar values too. They don't want to spend money on it either. Yeah. <laughs> Aside from being a classic example of closing the stable door after the horse has bolted, this, is, this also raises some very interesting questions. For one thing, it suggests that lawmakers know that sex education is effective at addressing teen pregnancy rates. That's why they're, te that's why they're willing to deploy if the necessity arises. Why then would they wish to implement it only selectively? The answer lies in the Judeo-Christian morality that dominates this country. Further examination of the ways in which sex education and religi religiosity vary across the United States reveals a link between the two and the impact this has on what's taught in the classroom. And here's a fact, in no state where at least 45% of people identify as very religious is the teen birth rate below 25 births per 1,000 girls. We're talking about Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Texas, also known as the Bible Belt. Correlation is, of course, not causation, and there are certainly many, many factors that contribute to teen births, but it, it seems clear that deep religiosity does not provide an outstanding starting point for states hoping to address unplanned, unplanned teen pregnancies. Um, you've both raised girls. Mm -hmm. how, how have you addressed that, if, if it's not too personal to ask? <clears throat> how have I addressed Sex education. Sex education, since I it's am, not being taught in the schools. I am extremely open um, to my teen. I basically just explain things from a medical standpoint. Um, I don't, um, I don't, <laughs> it's really hard. Yeah, you know, we just kind of went by <laughs> if questions were asked. Mm -hmm then respond to them in a, in, right. a, in a very sort of objective way. It's interesting too though that that needs to be done more because back when there were more rural farm communities, mm -hmm. there wasn't a whole lot of explaining that had to be done. Because right. Because it's part of the whole life of the, of the livestock and everything else. Mm -hmm. So it, I think a lot of that became sort of a natural observation. Uh, so society has changed that somewhat. Yeah, my teen knows that she can come to me and ask me about anything, mm -hmm. and believe me, she does. <laughs> yes, she does. Um, do either of you think that there might be a specific um, reason or a, a, a background to why the less religious states have less teen pregnancies? Uh, uh, there are probably a lot of reasons, and one of them that pops to mind, though, is that um, it's sort of when you're actually taught to th about what the consequences are, uh, the whole idea of responsibility, and what it means in a long-term impact, mm -hmm. and, th and think about those things and either process them yourself and with input, I, I think it gives you a little bit longer-term view and, and helps that impulse control more, and helps um, you know the whole idea that if, if it's gonna happen, you do something to, to, to protect yourself mm -hmm. from, from having a, a baby when you're 13 or 15 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Before you're ready. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and well, you're never ready. I believe anymore. there's a lot of um, <laughs> shame put on something that is so natural and instead of just being open mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with your children about um, being ready and uh, doing it in a safe way and uh, provide all this information, they want to um, keep them away from it. And the more, you know, the older teens get, the more questions they have, they're gonna get the answers. Um, so, and they also still have these feelings. So 
instead of being told by their parents or you know in school uh, through sex education a uh, healthy way of doing things um, and maybe be provided with um, birth control condoms they're not they're sneaking off and doing something that they feel is natural mm -hmm. whether or not they're they can make responsible decisions at that age is up to the individual or their parents or whoever right um, but I believe that it's um, they you know people from a religious background um, throw a lot of shame and don't want to discuss things you know things well, I think too and to and especially the Abrahamic religions um, girls and women are property mm -hmm. they're they're taught this is what you're here for it's um, you're not supposed to do it before marriage yada 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 and we all know teens are gonna have sex so if mm -hmm. you just tell them don't do it before marriage uh, abstinence only and teach them that they're objects to begin with and teach boys uh, and young men that girls and women are nothing but objects it, it's pretty much a free-for-all with uh, no no self-respect no respecting somebody else no self-worth no uh, mm -hmm. giving someone else or recognizing someone else's worth and then you've not been taught about condoms and birth control and you know being able to talk to to maybe your parents or an adult mm -hmm. who's just gonna say this is wrong this is wrong you're going to hell versus okay let's have a rational discussion about this right. and and talk about what needs to be talked about I think another part though is the whole idea that it's sort of a for, it's a forbidden fruit kind of thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's a mystery sort of thing and so that's can have the reverse kind of effect. <laughs> yeah, didn't we learn through history that that's not right? If you... <laughs> right? But um, I think for uh, my daughter, she seems to be even more responsible about uh, sex and sex education. Um, I don't <laughs> want to say too much on camera, but <laughs> <laughs> she's... She's abstaining mm -hmm. on her own. Of her own choice. Yes. Because of the conversations we've had, she knows she's not ready. Like, I just think that it works so much better to be open and to know she knows that she could come to me, you, mm -hmm. her other aunt, um, you know, several other people that she could come to if she needed you know, birth control or condoms or anything mm -hmm. like that or advice. And, you know, the main thing is we're trying to get our little people um, to have a good foundation, self-worth, self-esteem, you know, so they're not just allowing people to, you know, treat them like a doormat and, you know, females they can be treated mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. That's the whole you, idea. Uh, that, well, I mean, anybody that, can. That but. You feel empowered enough to say no mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. uh, stand up for yourself. And you teach boys that they're not objects. And when, when a, yeah. a girl or a woman or even, you know, another boy says no, that's what it means. I mean, they're not an mm -hmm. object. Yes, and, you know, I have a son, so I'm teaching him to respect women as equals and mm -hmm. not, you know, he's... He's young. Yeah. He's almost seven, so we don't really have uh, that in depth of um, sex talks. <laughs> but they do have questions that yeah. young. So, and I am open with them that young, too. Mm -hmm. I don't go into, you yeah. know, they're young, so I don't go into detail. Right. Yeah, I, mean, I remember back, we used to have gerbils, and back then you get male and female gerbils, mm -hmm. you don't even, can't anymore because there's a lot of issues with that. But again, it was like the farm thing. You sort of get mm -hmm, some mm -hmm. idea that, that, in a very general sort of sense, of what's going on. It not, um, and that makes understanding later that this sort of vague sort of connection and mm -hmm. how it fits together. But it gives mm -hmm. you some some basis to work with. Oh, yeah. um, real quick, back to our sponsors because we totally got in a rush and forgot about them for a moment. <laughs> um, but the Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK, uh, meets one or more times a week. Uh, we have meetups for food, fun, drink, and conversation. Find us online at knoxvilleatheistswithans.org. The purpose of ASK is to supply a venue for co community, camaraderie, and outreach to atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, and other like-minded persons in the East Tennessee area. Next Tuesday, the meeting is at 
And as of March the 6th, we have moved to Black Horse Pub and Brewery at 4429 Kingston Pike in Knoxville in the Western Plaza Shopping Center. And the IT Skeptics Book Club meets on the second Sunday of the month. The book for March 11th is I Contain Multitudes, Microbes Within Us and the Grander View of Life uh, by Ed Young. 2 p.m. to 4, location books a million, 8513 Kingston Pike. And you don't have to read the book to attend, but you will still have microbes. All right. And see www.rationalist.org um, for meeting times and locations and a list of future books. Uh, now, the third Sunday discussion topic is Mr. David Bolt will give a presentation on an engaged community building a sustainable future. And this will be an interactive program going over some of the highlights of David Bolt's 15-year journey of moving to a sustainable lifestyle. Some of the topics covered will include net zero energy houses, electric cars, and the demonstration site at ETPRI, which is the East Tennessee Permaculture Research Institute. The ETPRI demonstration site in South Knoxville has examples of rainwater harvesting, chicken raising, solar panels, tiny house living, and community gardening, among other sustainable practices. This program should be enjoyable and informative. We meet at 1015 in the cafeteria annex at the back of the Goins Administrative Building on the Hardin Valley campus of Pellissippi State Community College. It will be entertaining. It shouldn't be. It will be. <laughs> I didn't run it. <laughs> it absolutely will be. It will be. And back to our program. <laughs> Uh, empathy and altruism. Why are secular children more empathetic than those raised in religious homes? According to a study by the University of Chicago and published in Current Biology, in 2015, children raised in religious households are less altruistic than children raised in secular homes. I'd, I'd like to add Bobby. that. Oh, go, that go, go ahead. That again, that, that's a generalized statement because I know some people that um, more liberal Christians have, you know, children are, are uh, and that doesn't mean there aren't some religious right children that aren't that way. I mean, children vary a lot just in their sort of initial sort of biological beginnings. Um, you were talking about the middle one being a little different. I remember a case where um, some parents said they had a, a child and they thought they were the best parents in the world so they had the second one and realized it wasn't all they're doing. <laughs> so, well, parenting is definitely a difficult job. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, <laughs> there it's is a, no uh, manual that would even help. <laughs> but I, I think just a secular humanist perspective is probably the closest you're going to get to a manual mm -hmm. and then understanding just doing some research on uh, basic current understandings of child rearing and comparing them, making sure you're not getting some wacko one because <laughs> yeah. they're, they're out there. To continue, quoting Professor Jean Deserti, Des Desiti? I would go with that. <laughs> the, the, Irving, the Irving B. Harris Distinguished Service Professor in Psychology and Psychi Psychiatry and director for the University of Chicago Child Neurosuit. Our findings contradict the common sense and popular assumption that children from religious households are more altruistic and kind towards others. In our study, kids from atheist and non-religious families were in fact more generous. According to the University of Chicago's article written by Susie Allen, the study included 1,170 children between ages of 5 and 12 from six different countries, Canada, China, Jordan, South Africa, Turkey, and the United States. For the altruism task, children participated in a version of the dictator game in which they were given 10 stickers and provided opportunity to share them with another unseen child. Altruism was measured by the average number of stickers shared. For the moral sensitivity, sensitivity task, children watched short animations in which one character pushes or bumps another, either accidentally or purposefully. After seeing the situation, children were asked how much mean behavior was, 
about how, how mean the behavior was and the amount of punishment the character deserved. Consistent with previous studies, in general, the children were more likely to share as they got older, but children from households identifying as Christian and Muslim were significantly less likely than children from non-religious households to share their stickers. The negative relation between religiosity and altruism grew stronger with age. Children with a longer experience of religion in the household were the least likely to share. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Children from rel religious households favored stronger punishments for antisocial behavior and judged such behavior more harshly than non-religious children. These results support previous studies of adults which have found religious religiousness is linked with punitive attitudes towards interpersonal offenses. All right, so both of you as parents, how do you feel about that? Oh. Well, uh, it makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the whole idea of the punitive nature of um, Abrahamic religions and the whole patriarchal authoritarian viewpoint and, and, the, and the idea that we're, you know, original sin and we're inherently evil mm -hmm. are, are working against the whole natural empathy empathetic part of, of humanity. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would blame that sort of thing quite a bit on on ideology. It's not only uh, other ideologies that have similar problems, but they're all based on made up things that people say, this is what you have to believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so again, that's the problem of, of um, the whole top-down authoritarian approach. Yeah, I, I will point out too in that study that mm -hmm. the the reason that it specifically states uh, Christian, Muslim, and secular homes is there were other participants um, or participants from other religious backgrounds, but those were the three major um, religious Group. groups. The other ones were very small percentages. Uh, so it wasn't just Christian and Muslim and secular. It was Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Jewish, uh, Hindu. It was a variety of them. Yeah, there, are, there are a lot of usually smaller groups of of tribes or smaller cultures mm -hmm. that are much more, um, even much more sharing than we consider probably normal. Right. So, I mean, what we're learning from a lot of this is you don't need a God to be a good parent or to raise good children. You just need to be a good parent. <laughs> you just need, you need to, to have a good uh, moral standing yourself. Right. Well, that's one of the things that gets me when people say, well, how can you have uh, any kind of moral direction without religion? Well. There's so many assumptions built in that. Uh, one, assuming your parents were horrible <laughs> and did terrible things, teach you do terrible things. Mm -hmm. Two, it assumes that the whole idea that you're again inherently horrible, mm -hmm. and the whole idea that I, you know, you, if you didn't have religion, you would go out and rape and kill people. Um, I believe but, you're inherently good. Yeah, and unfortunately, it is time to wrap things up. Already? Yes. <laughs> this happens every time. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the wrap-up page, which I am not on. <laughs> um, get out your pen and paper. This has been Free Thought Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. You can give us feedback by email at freethoughtforum at yahoo.com or on our Facebook page, Free Thought Forum Knoxville. See, Shawnee keeps you and straight. your family, <laughs> you and your friends, and they can see the show on Wednesday evenings from 6.30 to 7.30 Eastern Time on this Knoxville station and online at ctvknox.org. And we would like to thank Sam Riv, Faithless. We else out here? Riv had to leave early. For technical support and the staff of KTV, not KTV, KNOX, and all of our viewers and callers. Yes, especially our callers. And um, nuns who identify with no religion are the fastest growing religious group in America. If you don't believe in God, you are.